Hey everyone, welcome back to Here in Apologetic. Super pumped to join us today. Today I have Dr. Johnny Gibson. He has a PhD at Cambridge University and he's an associate professor of the Old Testament at Westminster Theological Seminary. We're going to be talking about the book of Joshua and all things that are along those lines. So Johnny, welcome. How are you today? Good. Good. Thanks, Zach. Thanks for having me on your podcast. Yeah, I'm super pumped for today in this conversation. And we're going to do like a big survey of the book of Joshua, talking about where it comes from, how it's divided, and just like kind of like some of the big questions surrounding the book. So, Johnny, to start things off, do you want to talk a little bit about like who you are and what you do? Uh, yeah. So, as you've introduced me, I'm called Johnny, married to Jackie. We have uh, four children Benjamin, Layla, Zachary, and Hannah. Um, as you can hear from my accent, I'm not from here. Uh, I like to tell people I'm from Texas, but uh, they don't believe you me. You sound pretty Texan, Texan to me. Yeah, you know, I think so. Uh, my accent's from Belfast, Northern Ireland, where I was uh, brought up after being a missionary kid in Tanzania for a number of years. And uh, then I went off, studied at Moore College in Sydney, Australia. Met my wife, Jackie, there in Australia. Married. We moved to Cambridge for my PhD. I uh, did four years PhD in the uh, Hebrew text of the book of Malachi. Uh, and then I became a Presbyterian minister while I was in Cambridge. I came to Presbyterian convictions, became a minister, was there for a couple of years as a minister, and then had a call to come and be a professor, uh, an Old Testament professor at Westminster Theological Seminary in Philadelphia. So we've been here five years and uh, I teach Old Testament. I teach Hebrew. I teach Genesis through to Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, uh, two courses on that. And then I teach a bunch of PhD classes, uh, Lamentations, Malachi, Old Testament, use of the Old Testament, and uh, advanced biblical Hebrew prose and poetry. And uh, yeah, that's, that's what I do. I'm a minister ordained in the International Presbyterian Church in the UK, and I've kept my ordination credentials there. That's super cool, Johnny. So what got you interested in questions surrounding like the Old Testament in the book of Joshua, Johnny? Uh, well, Old Testament in general, I loved Hebrew when I studied it as a seminary student. And uh, I loved Greek as well. And I was probably better at Greek than I was Hebrew. And I thought if I don't keep studying Hebrew uh, at a PhD level, I'll lose my Hebrew, whereas I thought I could at least keep up my Greek a little. So I sort of went into Old Testament to keep up my Hebrew and then uh, when I became a professor, I've been teaching Hebrew and having to teach books of the Old Testament like Joshua. So Joshua has become one of my favorite Old Testament books, Genesis, Exodus, Joshua. Those would be some of my top books in the Old Testament. Uh, so that's really where my interest in the books come from is having to teach it. Yeah, that's super cool. So I think at this point, Johnny, it'd be helpful to just kind of give like a big overview of the book of Joshua. So I'd be curious then, Johnny, if you could just talk about like, what is the book of Joshua all about when we're looking at it from like a bird's eye view? Yeah, so the way I uh, summarize uh, the book of Joshua to my um, students is uh, in this short sentence, I say the book of Joshua is all about how the kingdom of God is realized through God's holy representative, Joshua, who leads God's holy people, Israel, in holy harem warfare to cleanse Canaan of idolatry and establish it as a holy place of pure worship as they dwell under God's law. So what I mean by that is uh, the book of Joshua is really typological. It's really a shadow of the coming kingdom of God in a second Joshua, in Jesus, which is the Greek name for the Hebrew name Joshua. Uh, how God will establish his kingdom on earth through another Joshua who will cleanse the earth of idolatry and establish it as a holy place of pure worship as God's people dwell under his holy law. So that's what I think the, the book of Joshua is about from a bird's eye perspective. Mm, that's super helpful so we're gonna especially get into some of these like big questions you talked about like the idea of like harem and what that means so we'll dive into that in a minute but i'm curious for the time being johnny so who wrote joshua because i think like at least for me like implicitly like when i was in like the sunday school like five-year-old i was like oh wait joshua wrote joshua right like it's called joshua um but like so who wrote the book of joshua do we know and like where does it kind of come from when we're thinking about the origins of this book 
Well, the Jewish tradition is that it was written by Joshua. The book takes its name from Yehoshua, Joshua, <clears throat> um, and that is actually the Jewish tradition that Joshua himself wrote it. <clears throat> Excuse me. And there is some good foundation for that. There's a number of eyewitness uh, aspects to the book. Um, for example, in chapter 5, verse 1, it says um, that the waters of the Jordan dried up until we had crossed over. So whoever the writer is, sounds like he was there and he crossed over. Uh, Joshua is an eyewitness to Rahab. Uh, Joshua saves her alive. And uh, Joshua is said to write these words in the book of the law of God. And he took a large stone, set it up under the terebinth tree that was by the sanctuary of the Lord. So we have Joshua writing things down in the book of Joshua. So I think there's good reason to think that he at least began writing the book, if not uh, write, uh, wrote the whole thing. Uh, but then on the other hand, some passages suggest that it was written after Joshua's death. Uh, there is the recurring phrase, to this day, which suggests that it's at a later point than Joshua. Uh, the closing part of the book records Joshua's death, which seems a little strange if Joshua wrote it. He would have to have prophesied his own death. Um, and then also there's a part in chapter 19, verse 47, where it locates the tribe of Dan in the north. But Dan, the tribe, only migrated into the north and conquered the people up in the north in the time of the judges, which was before the time of Joshua. So it seems that somebody's updating things at the very least in the book of Joshua. And so I think our best guess is that it was written shortly after Joshua, probably took a number of his own writings and records of the conquest, and then put it into a book sometime between the death of Joshua and the early monarchy period around the time of David. So sometime between Joshua and David, I think the book was written. Who exactly wrote it will have to wait to heaven to ask and find out. Yeah, it's, we'll see. Um, so with the book of Joshua then, so would you say that there's kind of like this idea of um, like even going back to Joshua, where we have some of these writings and then maybe like a scribe or someone is like adding to this a little bit in a sense. And then we have like around like the time of like the beginning of the monarchy, where like it's like the final form where like all these different, maybe not all these different writings, but like this, like it's kind of like finalized almost. Would that be kind of like an assessment of what's happening here? Um, yeah, I, I still like to think that it was one person who wrote it, but he had a number of sources available mm -hmm. to him and uh, he compiled them all and then wrote the book. And I, as I say, I think Joshua could have written a vast amount of it. But yes, I've got no problem with some kinds of updating in certain places. Um, but it depends what we mean by that. If people start to want to say there's two two prophets who wrote a book like first Isaiah, second Isaiah. I think that's where you get into problems, but I think mm -hmm. there, the text itself suggests that there was a later hand updating things, but uh, at no point do we really get into the idea of editors and redactors. It's more just that this is still under the authority of the prophets. And so whoever was even doing the updating, I think was a prophet or at least carried that kind of authority in the community to do it yeah that's really helpful thank you so one of the big things in the book of joshua is it seems like it's almost divided into like two different sections so you have joshua like 1 through 12 which ends with in joshua 12 where we have like this big like list of kings that were defeated by moses and kings that were defeated by joshua and then it seems like there's almost like a second section where it goes from joshua 13 to the end so like would you say then johnny like there is this kind of like division within the book of joshua and then like why what does this mean um when we're looking at kind of like that structure and format of the book of joshua yeah, I think broadly speaking, we can say that I, I like to divide the book into four um, sections. So chapters one to five is entering the land. And uh, the key verb that's used in the Hebrew is avar, to cross over. It's a word that keeps being used over and over. So chapters one to five is about entering the land. Chapters six to 12 is about conquering the land and the dominant Hebrew verb in this part of Joshua's lakak, which means to take. And uh, so that's the conquering part. Chapters 13 to 21 is the allocation of the land, so allocating the land. And there it's the verb halak, which is to apportion or to divide. Um, and then there's an epilogue in chapters 22 to 24 with, again, avad, 
is the verb there to serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So I think there's four sections, entering the land, one to five, conquering the land, six to 12, allocating the land, 13 to 21, and then an epilogue about serving the Lord, chapters 22 to 24. Hmm. Yeah, it's really helpful. So thank you, Johnny. So one important question I'd love to tackle here is this question of like, um, like the conquest of like the Canaanites, because I know like, at least for a lot of my listeners, um, this is a very like big issue. Cause like if some like Christians will try to like try to defend and say like, Hey, maybe we have like this data, this evidence that supports this. We may have some like of my amazing atheist agnostic listeners that will wonder, well, it seems like there's this big like moral problem here with like God supposedly like commanding genocide and things like that. So I'd love to dive into this a little bit with you, Johnny. So one of the things you talked about in the beginning was this idea of harem. So maybe you want to just start off, like define what that is and how that's going to like play a role when we're looking at <clears throat> the potential like conquest of the Canaanites in Joshua. Yeah, harem is the Hebrew word for the ban or the devotion or the destruction. And so it's used in Joshua about the devotion to destruction of the cities. It can actually be a positive word to separate things for devotion to God. Uh, but in this case, it's used negatively to separate something for destruction. So it was a curse that was commanded and ordered by God uh, on the Canaanite people living in the land that God had promised to Abraham. And so quite naturally, uh, people raise concerns about this. This sounds like xenophobia, sounds like ethnic genocide. And uh, prominent atheists like Richard Dawkins and the late Christopher Hitchens have uh, said here is good evidence that the Bible is a brutal, horrible book, presents a horrible God who would do this to a people. And uh, the aspect of harem warfare that was so hard to take uh, and still is, as we think about it, is it, it meant the total destruction of families, of cities. So it meant killing women, children. Uh, animals, uh, the whole thing uh, was devoted to destruction. So that's where the problem uh, arises. I can give you um, some reasons why I think you can defend it, um, explain it. Uh, I'm happy to go into those if you'd like. Yeah. I So just to clarify before we get into that. So then in your view, Johnny, when we're looking at like what's happening in the book of Joshua, we have God commanding, say, the death of like men, women, children, animals. That's what you think is going on here in these in these passages. Yeah. Some biblical scholars try to soften the, the verb harem and say it doesn't really mean that. Mm -hmm. And there are certain parts of uh, the record in Joshua and also in Deuteronomy where it's clear that the harem did not entail a complete destruction in every single case, but mm. certainly in the likes of Jericho and um, Hatsor and places like that, it certainly did include that. So I don't think we can get around it by softening the meaning mm. of harem. I think it means what I've just explained it means. Mm. Uh, but uh, let, let me give you some of the reasons why I think uh, the Bible actually explains why God ordered this. And then perhaps we can get more into the theodicy of it later. What you know? How can God be good and just to order something like that? But here's the rationale in the Old Testament for God ordering the harem uh, warfare. Firstly, it was to prevent Israel slipping into idolatry. Uh, if you remember the commands in Exodus and Deuteronomy, God warned his people not to intermarry with the other nations. And he said, because if you do, You'll, your sons will be led into idolatry. And then, in a sense, Israel will be subject to the harem curse as well. So it was really to help of keep Israel from destruction, from falling into idolatry themselves, either individually or corporately. Uh, it was also to ensure Israel fulfilled their calling to bring blessing to the world. If they went into the land and then just intermingled with these people, they would not have maintained their status as a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, which was really their way to uh, be a blessing to the world. So, yes, there is destruction for the Canaanites, but ultimately it was that there would be blessing uh, for the whole world. Um, it was to teach Israel that the Lord was God alone. They were to have no other gods before him. And so they were to destroy the people who worshipped these go other gods and to destroy everything connected uh, to those gods. 
Uh, it was to play out the promise of Genesis 3.15, where God said he would put enmity between the woman and the serpent, between the offspring of the serpent and the offspring of the woman, and that he would eventually send an individual who would crush uh, the serpent in the head. And so the conquest in Joshua is really a footnote to Genesis 3.15. It's really uh, a microcosm of Genesis 3.15 that's playing out. Now, that still sort of doesn't justify mm -hmm. uh, such an extensive destruction of men, women, and children. So perhaps, again, here's some here's some rationale or apologetic or defense for uh, the actual harem that took place. Uh, the first thing was that other nations at the time did it as well. Uh, but theirs was more inhumane. Israel's was actually very humane. It was very clean destruction, whereas um, the other nations would do very terrible things to children uh, before they killed them. And the way they killed them, it lacked dignity. So there is in a sense that Israel's harem was of a more humane nature than the other nations. Secondly, Israel never engaged in harem warfare or holy wars. It's also been called beyond Canaan. Uh, it, holy war was not an expansionist sanctioned genocide across the world. It was only for a specific time in a specific place on a specific people. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Israel were as susceptible to harem curse uh, if they committed idolatry. So they weren't above the law, we might say. They weren't above harem curse themselves. Um, the slaughter of the Canaanite chil children meant that the, the, the Canaanite nation would not continue to propagate its ungodly, wicked behavior. One of the things that the Canaanites did was child sacrifice. So you could argue that actually by wiping out the Canaanites, God was sparing more and more children of that experience and that tragedy. Um, we shouldn't miss God's patience, actually, in the conquest. Um, Genesis 15, verse 6, God says to Abraham that your descendants will go into a land for 400 years. And uh, after 400 years, I will bring them out of the land and back here. And he says, until the sin of the Amorites has, fit, has reached its completion. So there's a sense in which God was patient with the Amorites for 400 years before he brought the harem warfare down. Mm -hmm. uh, John Chrysostom puts it beautifully. He says um, that uh, God was six days in creating the world and seven days in destroying one city. And I think that captures beautifully the patience of God and the, that city being Jericho. They marched around the city for seven days. So the, I think we shouldn't miss the patience of God. Actually, he, he gave some of the people opportunity to repent. Those who did repent uh, received his mercy. So Rahab repented and said, I want to, I believe in the Lord, Yahweh. I want to join Israel. And she was shown mercy. So there was mercy available. Um. It's tied to God's justice, really. I think that really gets to the core of the theodicy problem. How can God be good and just to do this, uh, to conquer and wipe out people like this? Well, I guess it depends on your view of sin and God. If you believe that God is holy and we're sinful, then in a sense, we all deserve to die at some point. And for God to enact that judgment early in people's lives, like in the conquest, He's not doing anything unjust because we all deserve to die because we're all sinners. It's just that he's brought the judgment forward or early in a sense. Mm -hmm. um, another reason we, we, another thing we need to think about is that this harem warfare, it, it was serving a spiritual redemptive purpose. And I mean that typologically, it was serving as a type of a future judgment to come, and that is the end time judgment at the end of the world when God will send his son, Jesus Christ, to judge the living and the dead. The conquest in Joshua is like a, a shadow, a pre-released trailer. Like, you know, you get the movie trailer about a movie that's coming, and you get the little clips of what's coming. 
Well, that's really what Joshua and the conquest is like. It's, it's a movie trailer. It's telling us what's coming and it anticipates it a little earlier. Um, and so we need to keep in mind the typological significance of the, um, of the event. And then we need to think in the New Testament, these things don't continue. As I said earlier, it was for a specific time in a specific place on a specific people. And this kind of harem warfare doesn't continue today in this form. God doesn't sanction this or order it for the church. It's gone from physical to spiritual. We are still at warfare. We still have an enemy. We still have to conquer the world for Christ. But we're no longer physically killing people. Uh, but we are bringing the sword of the spirit, the word of God to them. And by that, we're piercing their hearts with it. And then from that death, if you like, they're being brought to life by the spirit as they believe the gospel. Um, 2 Corinthians 10, 4 verse 15, Paul talks about being at war, destroying people's arguments uh, so that they might submit to God. And so the, the, the warfare has moved from being physical to spiritual. Um, so I hope those things can help. I, I don't think at the end of the day, it's an easy thing to, to think about. Um, John Calvin uh, said that the, um, the command is dreadful indeed. He said, God is just to order it, but the command is dreadful indeed. And so we should tremble. We should uh, feel the ache of what that would have been like for Canaanite fathers and mothers and children. Um, and it should remind us that sin is serious and God doesn't take it lightly. Mm. Um, but we, what we want to do is keep it focused ultimately on the typological trajectory. It's heading, it's pointing us to the end time judgment, but then ultimately it points us to the cross where Jesus on the cross, an innocent victim, a truly innocent victim is punished in the place of others. That, that's really the great theodicy question in the whole Bible. How could God punish his own son who was innocent? And the answer is that Jesus anticipated that end time judgment on the cross. He absorbed the wrath of God. He underwent, if you like, the harem curse uh, for us in our place. And so the book of Joshua points us ultimately to the cross and to that time when God pours out his end time wrath early on the Lord Jesus so that everyone who trusts in him, puts their trust in him, will not have to face that end time judgment because the price has already been paid by Jesus Christ. And so Joshua, as a book, is a hard book to read in some sense when you take into account what exactly it's telling us with the harem warfare. And yet it's a beautiful book because it points us to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Mm. That's super helpful. So thank you so much, Johnny, for kind of laying that out. I do want to say we will go to a little bit of live Q&A in a few minutes. Um, I have a few more questions, though. So one thing I think would be helpful, Johnny, is you laid out a defense of trying to understand of like how like a good God could command like um, the harem that you're talking about in the book of Joshua. And how would you help someone who has like these intuitions? Because um, I think a lot of people like struggle to see like just like a priori, like how could like a good God command like the killing of people? Um, and you kind of laid out some of your theodicies and it's really helpful. And I think that can help a lot in thinking about this thing. Um, but do you have like, like how would you help someone with like trying to get over like that, maybe the initial intuition against the idea of like God commanding something like uh, what you read in Joshua? Well, I think I would say to people is what, what do you think you deserve from God? He's the creator. He's holy. Uh, you're the creature. You're sinful. What does God owe you? You know, does he owe you something? Uh, this is his world. He made you. He blessed you. And yet you've turned your back on him. So what, what does he owe you? Um, he owes us nothing. In fact, the only thing he owes us is justice. Because he's holy and we've sinned against his law, we deserve to be punished. And so that's what he owes us is punishment. And so if he gives us punishment, at some point in our life, whether it's when we're young, teenager, adult, or old, and he brings death to us, uh, we're only getting what we deserve. Um, and so the longer we live, every day that we live is actually an act of God's patience and mercy with us. 
And so I think we need to look at it from that perspective that every day we live is mercy and patience from God. And uh, as Chrysostom said, God took six days to make the world. He took seven to destroy one city. He took six days to make the world. And how long have we been living on earth? For me, it's 44 years. He's been merciful to me for 44 years. I deserve to die like everyone else, but he's been kind to let me live. And through faith in his son, I am looking forward to eternal life with him. Um, so again, in one sense, there's no, in one sense, the answer is actually quite simple. God is holy. We're not. We're sinful. He is perfect and he has to punish us. If he didn't punish us, he wouldn't be good. If you think about governments who catch people who have broken laws, who have murdered people, who have raped women, who have abused children, if you think about governments who catch such people and then they don't punish them, you know, everything in us screams for justice. And we don't think those governments are good governments. We think something's wrong here. Um, so it's the same with God. He, he has to punish us. Otherwise, he wouldn't be good. Hmm. It's super helpful. So thank you, Johnny. I really like how you kind of laid out and thinking about that. So that's really helpful. So I have one more question for you. And this idea of you hinted at it a little bit already, looking at like the idea of Christ. But how does jo the book of Joshua fit into like when we think about like the larger picture of like scripture and as Christians, when we think about um, like God's plan, how does Joshua fit into that um, bigger story? Yeah. So let me just restate <clears throat> the sort of summary question of what I think the book of Joshua is about. And then I'll, I'll proceed to answer your question, Zach. Uh, remember, I think the book's about how the kingdom of God is realized through God's representative, Joshua, uh, who leads God's holy people, Israel, in holy harem warfare. Uh, to cleanse Canaan of the idolatry and establish it as a holy place of pure worship where his holy people live under his holy law. The key to kingdom realization in Joshua, you see what's, what's very interesting about Joshua is we all know the memory verse or that we all know the verse at the beginning of Joshua mm -hmm. and it's become a memory verse for many of us. Uh, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. But what's interesting is that that's a singular imperative. That's masculine, singular in the Hebrew. It's a command to Joshua, not to the people. And um, if you read chapter one, you get to the end of chapter one, the people say, you know, Joshua, we will obey. We will be courageous with you. But actually, the first command is given to Joshua. And then you get to the end of the book and you see here Joshua say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Uh, so. What we see in the book of Joshua is that kingdom realization will only come through the covenant obedience of God's holy representative as he conducts harem warfare on the idolatrous inhabitants of the land. If Joshua is obedient, um, then Israel will inherit the promised land and the kingdom will be realized. If Joshua is disobedient, then the kingdom will be jeopardized. And you see this little incident in chapter seven with Achan, where Achan, one of the sort of leaders in the people, keeps some of the idolatrous uh, items from uh, the city of Ai. And the, it's sort of kept, it's, a, it's an idolatrous um, item. And the people go to fight against the people of Ai and they get whipped. Uh, they get their butts kicked. And why is that? It's because one of the leaders of God's people has been living in sin. And when Achan is found out and then he's stoned to death, they go back and fight the people of Ai and they kick their butts this time. And that's because they're now a holy people because Joshua has sanctified the leadership of, of Israel. And so what we see is that it all turns on Israel's leaders and in particular on either Israel's leader, Joshua. If he is obedient, then the kingdom is realized. And Joshua, actually, in the book, if you think about it, he's a bit like Joseph, Daniel, Job, these figures in the Old Testament who are presented to us as, I need to do this, get my fingers on the camera here, as uh, sinless. Uh, you don't hear of Joshua, Joseph sinning, of Daniel sinning, of Job sinning, and we don't hear of Joshua sinning. They're presented to us as sinless 
individuals. And in that sense, they serve as types of Christ, uh, the one who will come and through his covenant obedience will conquer the enemy and bring God's people into their inheritance. And that's what Joshua typifies. Um, he is like a new Adam in a new land. He is a prophet speaking God's law. He's a priest uh, interceding for the people when they disobey. He is like a king roaming land and destroying and conquering the kings of Canaan. So Joshua is a type. He's a prophet, priest, king in a, in a new Adam in a new land. And he, through his covenant obedience, destroys the enemy and brings God's people into their promised inheritance, the paradise of the promised land. It's like Eden. Well, what does, who does that remind you of? <laughs> and uh, when you get to the New Testament, Jesus is the Greek name for Joshua. And you see all the parallels with, um, with Joshua uh, in Jesus. And let me just uh, name some of them. Um, uh, Joshua begins his office at the banks of the Jordan River, where Moses dies and then he takes over. And he takes over at the Jordan River. Um, and he sets up 12 memorial stones as a memorial to the tribes of Israel. Well, Jesus begins his ministry at the Jordan. And uh, he then, after that, goes and chooses 12 men to be his disciples, forms a new people of God. Uh, Joshua won victory for Israel. Uh, uh, he won their inheritance through the courageous defeat of their enemies. Jesus wins us our inheritance of a new heavens and a new earth through the courageous defeat of his arch enemy, the devil. Uh, who, um, and then he goes into heaven and cleanses the heavenly temple for us to prepare a place for us. Uh, I love the connection between Joshua, Jesus, and the thief on the cross. Uh, the thief on the cross is one of G Jesus's or God's enemies, cursing Jesus, saying all these things about Jesus. But on the cross, he gets converted by Jesus. The enemy becomes the friend. And then he says to Jesus, um, will you remember me today when you enter your kingdom and your glory? And Jesus says, today uh, you will be with me in paradise. And so Jesus is the one, it's the true final Joshua, conquering his enemies and taking his chosen people in to their chosen paradise uh, and inheritance. Um so I think that's a beautiful way to connect Jesus um, to Joshua. Mm. Yeah, super well said. Thank you so much, Johnny. Um, so before we wrap up, Johnny, there is one question I want to get to um, that was asked during the show. Um, and it's from Shane Bretner, which says, are there any Hebrew words that are introduced in the book that have a rich theological meaning in the rest of the Bible? Um, I wouldn't say they're introduced. Harem is a rich biblical word. As I say, it's got a positive side as well as a negative. It's introduced earlier in the Pentateuch uh, about separating off and devoting something to God. In this case, it's used negatively of separating something off and devoting it to destruction. Um, uh, some of the verbs I mentioned earlier uh, in the book, uh, you have the crossing over, the avar, verb uh, which is significant for them crossing over it's like a new exodus if you remember the first exodus was through the red sea where the water separated well the same thing happens on a mini scale the jordan is separated and the people walk across on dry land so we have a uh, another type there of the exodus uh, sort of a second fulfillment of a of the exodus uh, the conquering of the land the lakak is um is significant for what I've mentioned there, conquering the enemies, and then the allocating the land, the halak, uh, dividing it up and apportioning it. It's God reestablishing his kingdom on earth, his kingdom that was ruined in the Garden of Eden, uh, where people moved east and out of the garden. He's In a sense, he's reclaiming a special holy realm for himself so he can dwell with his people again. And then the avad word to serve uh, is important. But again, that's used earlier in, in Exodus and other places. So um, I don't think there's any new Hebrew words as such introduced. I think the rich theological meaning is there in words that are used earlier in the Pentateuch. Mm. 
That's super helpful. Well, Johnny, this has been such a great conversation and I'm so grateful for your time. Do you have any kind of like last thoughts or things you want to say about Joshua or anything else before we wrap up here? No, except that I would encourage people to read the book. Let's try and read it in one setting if you can. Take you a couple of hours, but not, not much more than that. And as you do read it, think about how Joshua, um, how the commands in the early parts of Joshua, chapter one, are actually to Joshua, not to the whole people. And think about Joshua as a representative leader that has to be obedient, who has to be courageous. Um and who brings God's people into the inheritance and then connect it to Jesus, whose name is Joshua. Mm, that's super helpful. Well, Johnny, thank you so much. i um, so grateful for your time in this conversation. There's a link down below if you want to check out Johnny and his work, all kinds of things there. And I always encourage you, if you're new to our channel, always be sure to subscribe, leave a like, and all that fun stuff. And if you enjoy the con content, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com. Super grateful for everyone that's joined and supports. I'm so grateful. But Johnny, thank you so much for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure. So thank you. Thank you, Zach. Yes, and thank you to Shaim and Walking Truth and Susan and everyone else who joined us live. Um, have a good one, guys. God bless, and 